Assalamu alaikum and thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, um, uh, symposium that's jointly being on, organized between the Pakistan Society of Neurology and the Pakistan International Stroke Society. Uh, I was asked to present on um, uh, the importance of telestroke and the emerging technology of mobile stroke units. And uh, just to start off by showing you my conflict of interest declaration, I have none for this presentation. I thought I would let you know where I am uh, this morning as I was coming to work. This is what my backyard looks like. It's winter, it's very cold. I wish I was in Pakistan. Not this time, but hopefully inshallah next time. I love Lahore and um, I have very fond memories of the city. So what do I have for today? I have the following uh, objectives, uh, three objectives in fact. The first one, as I dive deeply into the importance of telestroke and the mobile stroke technology, I want to begin my presentation by why these uh, uh, technologies have become so useful and critical uh, in our management of acute stroke patients. And that's about time. Uh, time is so important uh, uh, to the success of treatment in acute stroke. Um, the time is important, but as important as time is the availability of CT scans. Unless you have a CT scan, that's the bottom line. Unless you have a CT scan, you cannot offer reperfusion therapy to patients with an acute stroke. And the reasons are the following. So no CT scan, no thrombolysis, no um, thrombectomies, et cetera. Um, the CT scan is important because there is currently no other, well, there's MRI scan, but there's no other technology beside imaging of the brain with CT or with MR to exclude the presence of an intracranial hemorrhage. So as we all know, the 20 to 30% of patients who come in acutely may have a hemorrhage. Unless you can exclude that hemorrhage, you will not be able to treat a patient with TPA. So in telestroke, it's important that the site that is treating the patient, they need to have CT scans. Also, besides a hemorrhage, there are many other etiologies that can present with uh, stroke-like symptoms. We call them mimics, since brain tumors are the, are the most common ones. So you want to make sure that you rule those out. CT scan, I believe, is also very important to give you an estimate of the severity of the irreversible damage. So you know the patient or the family may say that this episode occurred an hour ago, but your CT scan does not lie. If there is evidence of a clear stroke with some edema around it, which we see not that infrequently, um, that gives you an idea that in fact, the stroke is older than a few hours and therefore should not be treated. So multiple reasons to have CT scan. My first point was that the sooner you treat, the better it is. And so all over the world, uh, and I'll give you our examples also, everyone is trying to get the patient to the hospital fast, which unfortunately is not in our hands as much because after all the patient or the family would have to call the emergency services or as in the case in Pakistan, they would have to put the patient in the car and rush to the hospital. So the pre-hospital part of our, of our treatment is somewhat difficult and um, has uh, improved, but it's still an issue. However, the time between the patient coming to the emergency and the time that you start treatment, we call it the door to needle time, that has been improving. And as that improves, uh, the outcomes get better. So let me share with you as I uh, begin my presentation, uh, something that's uh, going to be published uh, early next year. So it's in stroke next year that looks at over 150,000 patients and they get with the guidelines. They start off with 2003 and up to 2018. What I want to show you in this figure uh, that I've uh, pulled from that presentation is 
that over time, over time, the percentage of patients who are getting their door to needle time within 60 minutes has gone from 20% to almost 80%. See that? A significant increase. Also, the percentage of patients who got their treatment within 45 minutes have also gone up from 10% to almost half the patients. In our center, um, we, we consider 45 minutes to be too late also, and we aim for 30 minutes. And I'll show you some of that data later on. So as, um, as the time to treatment, the total needle time has improved, you can see that the percentage of patients who are making full recovery, so the disability score of zero to one on MRS has increased from 17% to 25% to as high as one in three patients. So really critically important that you treat your patients as fast as you can, because better outcome means uh, uh, better, uh, better time to treatment means better outcome. Uh, we have some data from uh, randomized trials also, and our, um, uh, our emphasis has always been on the golden first hour. So that's where the telestroke and mobile stroke becomes really, really important. So um, what is the randomized trial data? So if you look at the, um, uh, the data on time to treatment, this is broken down into less than 90 minutes um, up to here. This is less than one hour, uh, up to three hours and four and a half hours. So in the up to four hour, four and a half hours, the number needed to treat is 14. So every, every 14 patients you, that you treat would give you one complete additional recovery that decreases down to um, uh, number needed to treat is nine or up to three hours but it, it is down to you know, one in four to or one in five if you can treat these patients in under, under 90 minutes. Uh, in these randomized trials, there were just not enough patients in the one hour. So if you look at that golden one hour, there were very few patients who were treated in under one hour. But that's where most of the action on the stroke ambulance is. So the stroke ambulances were first brought in in Germany. Um, and, and, and then this is Houston, and Cleveland Clinic. And so this is uh, Berlin here. They've done most of the work. And in their work, uh, unlike ours, they, in addition to the imaging facility, they have the radiologist and the stroke neurologist in their ambulance. So they were the first ones to show and what they were doing was they were comparing one week on the ambulance and one week off the ambulance. And what they wanted to show was how fast can you treat these patients in the ambulance, but they wanted to do a cluster design trial. So they compared the two weeks together. So in the weeks when there was no stroke ambulance, you can see that there are very few patients who get treated within the first 60 minutes, hardly any patients. However, in the weeks that the ambulance was available, you can see what happens. The majority of these patients get treated early, right? So this is where, and I'll talk about our experience later on, this is the biggest advantage of having an ambulance where you have a CT scan that goes uh, to the patient's home um, and the treatment is offered right there. So I'll give you numbers now. So um, in the randomized trials, uh, the most prominent of them was the NENS trial, which was published in 1995. If you look at their control arm, so if you look at their control arm in 100 patients, if you don't offer them any treatment, any thrombolysis at all, 26% of these patients would make a full recovery. So this is your comparator. In other words, uh, all these 74% of patients would not make a good recovery. So any treatment that you offer has to decrease these numbers. I am sorry, decrease these numbers in the red so that you can get more patients who make a full recovery. So four and a half hours, the current um, treatment of, uh, of uh, uh, for a reperfusion. And so if you look at the first 
a treatment, if you give it in the four, four and a half hours, you increase your patients who make a full recovery from 26% to 33%. So you've added seven more patients, right? If you however go in that one and a half hour treatment, so to cut that down from onset to treatment from four and a half hours now to one and a half hour, then you're gone up from 33% to 48%. So almost half the patients that are treated within 90 minutes would make um, full recovery. Uh, the most recent data with the ambulance is that if you however treat them within the first hour, the golden hour, you can see that 68% of these patients now, so you've gone up from 26% to 68%, and all these patients who are treated within the hour would make a full recovery. So the faster you treat, the better it is. So this is where telestroke and mobile stroke become very important. So let me first talk about telestroke. So uh, it's always important to talk about the safety of the treatment, first do no harm, and then does it make a difference? And can you do it at multiple sites? So I will first give you a preamble on the technology, and then I'll give, share with you our data uh, in, a, in a province that's almost two thirds the size of Pakistan. Um, all right, so when, when you see an acute stroke patient in the emergency department, this is what we do, we stabilize the patient and prevent immediate complications. So these are things like um, aspiration pneumonia, electrolyte imbalances, hypoxemia, et cetera. Once you've stabilized the patient, it doesn't take you more than five minutes to do that. You want to confirm your diagnosis, the CT scan, and then you want to determine if this patient is a candidate for TPA or for endovascular treatment or mechanical thrombectomy. So I'll give you a picture of our emergency room. That's where we'll start. And then I'll show you what we have at these telestroke sites. So first of all, this is our motto. Treatment begins here. The treatment actually starts. Here's our IV line ready to go. You do a plain CT scan. You've ruled out a hemorrhage. You've ruled out a mimic you start treating the patient. We are constantly monitoring our door to needle times in these patients. Once you've started the treatment, uh, the patient's on the table within 10 minutes uh, from the time they come to the emergency. Once you've started the treatment, then you do a CT angio. You want to look whether there's a, a critical stenosis in the carotid, or you also want to see if there's an intracranial occlusion that's amenable to treatment. In patients who come in within the first four, four and a half hours to our site, or who could get to us within four and a half hours in the ambulance or, or, or the telestroke sites, this is all you need. A good quality CT scan, imaging that shows an intracranial occlusion, and they're off to the uh, angio suite. Patients who present later than that, so anyone's coming in four hours to 24 hours. In fact, we would treat a person at Two days also, if the imaging, which is a CT perfusion, shows that there is tissue to save and the core is small. So if treatment is started, CTA has been done, the next step is to do a CT perfusion. Well, and there are many softwares available. So the one we, we like is uh, this one here called Rapid, which shows you the core. It actually calculates it for you. The core is 26 um, in this example whereas the penumbra or tissue to save is 160 mils. So that's available. In fact, my, my watch here uh, uh, gives this to me anywhere that, that I'm at home or in the hospital as we begin the treatment. I'm going to get, give you an example of what we call a fast progressive. So a patient who comes in, gets a CT scan, gets a CTA, there is an occlusion uh, of, of, of the uh, proximal right M1. This patient's uh, uh, CT perfusion is done. We consider this the fast progressor because the symptoms of, uh, are of less than two hours duration. This tissue to save and this tissue that's already damaged. And one of the ways to figure this out, in fact, in this software, is a program called a Hypo Perfusion Index. This is simply, uh, the formula is very simple. You divide the Tmax 10 which is the red, so it takes 10, 10 seconds 
to get the blood out there by T max six, which is six seconds. So the higher this number, the faster the progression. So to us, anything more than 0 0.4, 0 0.5 is a fast progressive. So this patient needs to get into the angio suite as fast as possible. Unfortunately, if this patient is two hours away on a telestroke site, we know that the outcome in this patient may not be as good as, for example, um, another patient in here. So this is another example I want to share with you. So this is 14 hours. 14 hours later, the core is tiny, right? Small core and a large penumbra. So this patient, when we look at the hypoperfusion index in this patient, you can see that it is 0.1, which means very little of the tissue, just this little red in here. This is where the ischemia is extreme, but most of the rest of the tissue has good collaterals. In this patient, this patient is transferred to us, is an M1 occlusion. This patient gets a first pass, the vessel opens up. 24 hours later, we do a repeat imaging, and in fact, there's no tissue damage at all. This patient makes a full recovery and is home. So that is what we do, not the MR, but at all our telestroke sites, we have CT, CTA, and CT perfusion available, which makes it possible for us to triage the patients that will do well versus those who are not going to do well. So um, let me just switch gears now into telestroke and give you a little bit of the history for our own program. So telestroke, uh, um, I believe, is amongst the most important uh, treatment options that have come out in the last 25 years. Uh, I, and I can share with you what I believe are the most important treatment options available. This is the first stroke unit. This is Sunnybrook, this is in Toronto. I've uh, been there several times. The stroke unit is one of the most important uh, stroke management intervention that's available. And I hope most hospitals in Pakistan would have these. I've already mentioned in 1995, we had the treatment with IV TPA. And then in the last seven, eight years, we've had multiple trials. We continue to have trials of thrombectomies. And finally, I believe the telestroke right here is also as important a discovery to get um, patients treated far and beyond where acute stroke expertise is available. So the first uh, publication, Steve Levine's a colleague of mine, published in 1999. It was an um, opinion paper at that time, the application and its importance um, in the management of, of acute stroke. So there are multiple applications and all of these are currently available to us. We, we use telestroke, not only for acute stroke, but we also use it for TIA consulta consultations. We look at the images and where the radiology expertise is not available, we offer uh, advice on how best to treat the, these patients, whether with thrombolysis or if these are candidates for, uh, uh, if they have large vessel occlusion and, and they're candidates for thrombectomy, we help what was called the drip and ship. So the dripping is started with the IV TPA at the local hospital. And as the IV is running, these patients are shipped, shipped to, uh, to um, uh, comprehensive stroke centers. Um, and then of course, we've been using it for many years now as an excellent means of an outreach um, stroke clinic also. So the technology is really very simple. Um, the stroke uh, neurologist could be at home or could be at, a, at, at our hospital um, at, at where they have a look at the scan. So it could be at home. Uh, and once they've reviewed the scan, also seeing the patient, so is the patient, uh, make a decision whether they need to treat the patient or not. And honestly, importantly, uh, across Canada, it's, it's almost uh, uh, from coast to coast, is more than 7,000 kilometers. So the patient could be on one coast, the neurologist could be at the other coast, and you can treat them very safely. This is Alberta, and this is where I'm going to focus for you. 
We also know this is just, just out recently, just came out a month ago, that um, centers that have telestroke actually do better uh, for their own patients and for all the centers around them also. So centers that have telestroke uh, have favorable outcomes for their own patients and it, it continues to improve as far as the outcome is concerned um, uh, in, 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 in patient treatments also. So uh, what, what, why I'm showing you this is that if you are a center in Lahore and if there's potentially sites in Sialkot or in um, uh, 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 other small, uh, well, it's not small, uh, multiple towns where there's imaging uh, available, your hospital's care improves while you're offering care to other hospitals. There are multiple guidelines that have been published in Europe, in Japan, in Korea, in North America. We have our Canadian guidelines, and we are now, our guidelines are treat appropriate patients with acute thrombolytic therapy. Uh, in hospital without stroke expertise. It is considered to be our standard of care. And, and there's also meta-analysis. So the most recent meta-analysis is earlier, um, uh, in about five years ago, that looked at seven studies totaling over 1,800 patients. And they were able to show that when you compare outcomes of thrombolysis and you compare them in telestroke sites to your comprehensive centers, there is no difference at all. See, see in here, this is your stroke center, this is your telestroke, you are exactly the same. And in fact, there is some uh, signal for better outcome, and it's not significant for uh, in telestroke because you can treat them faster. All right, let me summarize for you our own experience before I go to the mobile, st mobile stroke technology. So our, uh, we, we started um, Telestroke um, oh, around 2002, 2003, and we wanted to do it for a simple reason. So our reason was the following. This is our province. It's massive, it's huge. It's about 661 kilometers for compared with a population of less than 4 million. And Pakistan's area is about 881,000 kilometers. So a little smaller, but much smaller population. The comprehensive stroke centers are in Edmonton, which is where I am, and in Calgary. These are the two comprehensive stroke centers. So when we started our program, we had only three um, sites. So 2005, we had a, a town called Grand Prairie, Red Deer, and Lethbridge. Lethbridge would uh, refer to Calgary, and these two centers would come to us. But by 2012, we had a total of 26 centers that uh, keep us very busy. In fact, almost half our thrombolysis now happen in these sites. This site, for example, is over a thousand kilometers away from us. So we treat the patients up there in high level. So, so our analysis, I wanted to just give you some idea, is that we have two comprehensive centers, 26 primary centers where telestroke is available. These primary centers are managed by family doctors. And uh, the patients are admitted locally um, after TPA if they're not candidates for uh, thrombectomy. Uh, and if they're candidates for thrombectomy, they're either transferred to us by ambulance or by helicopter also, or, or also by fixed winged um, transportation also. We also uh, offer telestroke to another additional 78 hospitals where there's no um, a CT scans available, uh, but we, we, we would bring them to a site close to where a CT is available or where we, we can send our stroke ambulance. So roughly 30% of over, um, so over 200 TPAs that we offer to our population of uh, a total of 650,000. So over 200, uh, 200 of these are offered at telestroke sites. Um, the way it works is the patient can present to a stroke center, which could be primary stroke center or, or comprehensive center, uh, and, or the patient can pr present to a non-primary uh, st uh, st stroke center, uh, or the patient is picked up by the, by the ambulance crew and call 911. So if they are within the range of our mobile stroke unit, which is the next part of my presentation, we will set dispatch our stroke ambulance 
uh, if they are close to a primary stroke center uh, where the CT scan is available, these patients go to these, uh, uh, these centers or if they're closer to our comprehensive centers, they come to us directly. But we monitor, we monitor the door in, door out time. This is really important. So if they go to a primary center without CT scan, we want to keep them there as, as little time as possible so that we can start our treatment. Uh, we, we monitor our delays in transfers also. So to give you an example of how frequent and how, how, how big these sites are, it's kind of almost the end of my first part of the presentation. Uh, I wanted to show you the data, our most recent data that's available to us in 2017. I've put the size of these uh, towns, they're very small towns. Red Deer is 90,000, uh, Grand Prairie is 55,000, Camrose is uh, 17,000. And these are the number of telestroke um, uh, treatments that we, we are offering at these sites. Remember, these are the ones that we treat. But for these treatments, there are multiple other calls that come to us where we may offer advice or we just ask them that these are not candidates for treatment. So in that year where we treated all these patients at our peripheral sites, only 3% of the activations were for treatment and the majority of them led not to the treatment. So it's important, right? So we, we, we give non thrombolysis advice quite frequently also. To summarize my first present part of the presentation, then I hope I've convinced you the telestroke is very, very safe and it's, being, it, and it's being used increasingly to treat patients at smaller centers. Um, and not only is it important to treat those patients locally, it offers us an opportunity to figure out patients, especially those who are slow progressors. I gave you an example of that early. But, and, and if they have a proximal uh, intracranial arterial occlusion, and, and if they're candidates for thrombectomy, those patients can then be triaged. In, in a province, I, give, I showed you our, our geography, uh, which is about you know, 70, 80% the size of Pakistan, that we can bring these patients to these two stroke centers. And in my first part of the presentation, I'll wrap it up in about 10 minutes. I want to go into the mobile stroke technology. Very, very interesting. We have the only stroke unit, um, an ambulance with a CT scanner in the entire country. Uh, I was closely involved, it's about four or five years ago now, in the development. We, we um, had to put the CT scanner in the ambulance to make sure there was ex access to um, at the paramedic who could see this patient and manage them as the patient was coming in. Um, to our to our tertiary care center, the portable scanner. Interesting in in, in in invention. They're getting better and better now. So initially it was a mock-up. Um, once this was completed, so here's the assembly happening. I had to go to Quebec a few times for that, and this is the final product. So the CT scanner, the stretcher comes in here. We've got facilities for. Um, um, doing immediate uh, uh, blood CBC, glucose levels, PT, PTT, et cetera, in these patients. And remember, I not only treat the patients in here, but I can sometimes, this is me, uh, this is my part-time job. I fill the gas in the, in, in the car also, in the truck also. Uh, so what do we do with these patients? So uh, we, uh, we get a home call. The patient's coming out of the house. He gets in this mock as a, patient gets into the ambulance um, as, and as the IV lines are set up, this patient is then the, put into the, into the scanner. We usually have a stroke fellow who connects with us um, via telestroke. So here's the patient being examined. Here's a neurologist who would be offering treatment. And these treatments can be very spect spectacular. They can be, we, we have treated patients within 30, 35 minutes from onset of treatment, and I'll give you some of the published data on it. There's several centers, I'll give you an example very quickly of where these centers are, but publications from um, Hamburg, Berlin, Cleveland, um, Melbourne. Uh, so you can see that the alarm to needle time or door to needle time are significantly 
uh, smaller. So 36 minutes, 48 minutes, 55 minutes when you're activating your stroke ambulance. Um, recently, about uh, two, um, uh, about, about, about six weeks ago, there was a randomized trial data that was published in the New England Medical Journal by our colleagues in Houston, uh, who showed that compared to, to, to the treatment in the stroke ambulance, so that's, that's, a, that's, that's why uh, we want to prove that this treatment actually leads to better outcome also, because it's expensive to put an ambulance together. It cost us close to a million dollars to put the scanner into, in that ambulance that we used. So in a randomized trial, just published recently, it just, it just got out, September 9th is the date for it. Um, it's a multicenter randomized trial of 1,500 patients of whom 1,000 got TPA. So if you look at the modified Rankin scales, so zero to two, or zero to, zero to two means the person goes home, zero to one means they're fully recovered. So those who got TPA in the ambulance, full 36 or 37% had a full recovery compared to those who went to hospital. This is a highly significant outcome. So where are these ambulances? So at the present time, there, there are a number of them, there are about two dozen of them. Most of them are in Europe and in North America. This is ours in Edmonton. Um, and it's expensive technology. So that's why it's out here. We wanted to put one in Qatar. It's a long story, but I won't go into the details right now. One in Buenos Aires, one in Melbourne, and they continue to increase the number. So uh, out in the US, you can see Phoenix, Denver, Chicago, Toledo, et cetera. Um, and uh, the teams are very good. So the team in Houston is right here. This is John Grotta. This, he actually goes out of the ambulance like I do. Um, and uh, here's an example from South America in, uh, in Argentina. So ours is very unique. Ours is unique because see, most of these uh, ambulances are urban ambulances. What, what we have done, so here's Edmonton. This is a 250 kilometer range. So what we do is anytime, we, we, the ambulance is offered in, in the city itself, but we go all the way out to uh, 200, 250 kilometers. So in our case, what will happen is that here's our city, here's a patient in a small town, they come in in their ambulance and we send the stroke ambulance out. So here's an example of a patient coming in, they've got 140 kilometers and here's our ambulance going out. And so we rendezvous. So where we meet, what happens is this. There is an EMS ambulance coming in. Here's our stroke ambulance being discharged. Stroke uh, neurologist assesses the patient. This is really important, assesses the patient. If they are candidates for TPA and possible thrombectomy, so we start the TPA and send the patient to the comprehensive center. Many of these patients, almost half or more of these patients are stroke mimics. So we can offer a CT scan, we can give them a consultation and we send the patient back to the local hospital. Here's me standing, waiting for the ambulance on the roadside um, for a patient. And I wanted to share one of our most recent patients who was 87 years old, started, she was driving, developed dysarthria, left arm and leg weakness. And we were out there within 55 minutes and 14 minutes following our, our CT scan. This patient's, uh, here's a CT scan, pretty good quality scan. This patient had the IV TPA started, brought the patient to hospital, showed that there's a kind of a distal M, M1 or proximal M2 occlusion in this patient. So remember those uh, images I showed you? So this patient, you can see there is no core. It's all penumbra, so no core, big penumbra. Get a, um, a Im imaging done. So this is the first branch coming out. So very proximal, large M2 occlusion. Patient gets a, a, a first pass um, vessel opens up. Um, a day later, this is a CT scan. And then the next day, an MR shows just trivial. This is sliver of a small stroke in this patient. 
The ambulance CT scan gives us all kinds of surprises also. If you think they're ischemic strokes, but you see these big hemorrhages, and of course they're not candidates for treatments. Uh, one of our recent patients, we send them back to the local hospital. Here's another patient, well-established stroke, and in this case, we would not treat them also. So we recently published our analysis on uh, what kind of patients do we see. So the majority of them are strokes. Majority of them, we in fact ship to their local hospitals. After we see these patients, uh, we send them back. So a small percentage of them um, come back to us. And as I said earlier, many of these are stroke mimics also. Some of them can be sick stroke mimics. Um, so here's our, our data. So in, in those mimics, we had headaches, seizures, um, confusional states, we found a brain tumor, um, they had cardiac symptoms, infection, head injury, et cetera. So the, the, the stroke ambulance not only treats acute stroke, it also is an excellent means of triaging these patients and we prevent their transfer to a very busy hospital. So here's, uh, that was my last slide. So here's my summary for you. There is so much evidence. I mean, I, I just sometimes breaks my heart to see that we don't have enough uh, acute stroke treatment uh, offered to hospitals in Pakistan. Things are getting better though. There are multiple hospitals that now offer thrombolysis all across uh, the country, but these are at big hospitals, right? They are prominent hospitals. You could extend them out to smaller hospitals because I, I know CT scans are available everywhere. So if we can somehow get more um, expertise and somehow work with multiple government authorities to get uh, uh, TPA, uh, TPA or similar or other drugs available at these hospitals so that um, reperfusion therapies can be offered via telestroke at these smaller hospitals. I think it will make a huge difference. I mean, I didn't get into the details of uh, how big a problem stroke is, right? It's the leading cause of chronic disability, second most common cause of death. Um, and most of us have family members who are affected also. So it's a major problem. And I, I, and I firmly believe the telestroke offers you sufficient, um, the technology is pretty good. It, it, and you can safely treat patients at smaller hospitals provided they are willing to work with you. And it's cheap, cheap technology also. And finally, more expensive, but mobile stroke units uh, give us immediate access. And most of the patients that we treat um, actually make an excellent recovery. Thank you for your attention. And I'll stop here.